Hello, my name is Fisher Dodarian, and I am the Executive Director of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to The Life of the Mind, an interview with Ferenc Horker. Today marks the second interview in this series, and if you were able to join us for the first, or have since watched it online, you'll know from our discussion with Marek Matrazek that the area of Central and Eastern Europe were of great importance to Sir Roger. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Sir Roger spent time uh, and was actively engaged in establishing and supporting dissident networks in the region. Uh, and through this series, we hope to further explore that, coming to better understand both his work there and the legacy of communism uh, in these different countries. I'm especially excited about today as we talk with Ferenc uh, about Hungary, the current state of the life of the mind there and the legacy of communism uh, that they face. But I'll leave the rest to our senior fellow in the philosophy of culture and series host, Mika Wyslokovsky Road. Mika Wai is the uh, assistant, is a assistant professor, excuse me, uh, at the University of Warsaw. And he's also a tutor of philosophy uh, at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. He is an organizer and founder of the Humane Philosophy Project. He also uh, was a student of Sir Rogers and later a colleague of his uh, at the program Sir Roger Ran at the University of Buckingham. Mika Wai, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Fisher, very much. It's in turn, my great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, my friend and also uh, an authority on all the topics that he is an expert on, uh, Professor Ferenc Hurker, who is a philosopher, an intellectual historian, a poet, a critic, and a legal theorist uh, and political analyst. And his main interests lie in the philosophy, in, in philosophy, include political philosophy and the philosophy of art. Uh, he studied in Budapest, Oxford, and Brussels, Leuven, and he's a professor of philosophy at the Pasmani Pater Catholic University uh, in Budapest. And he's also a director of the Institute of Philosophy of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And his interests in intellectual history include early modern political thought, early modern aesthetic thought, and most recently, the history of modern Hungarian and Central European political thought. He has published widely on all these themes and regularly teaches at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow and the Babas Bolai University in Cluj-Napoca in uh, uh, Romania. Uh, he's also published four volumes on poetry, all in Hungarian, and Hungarian being a very uh, uh, peculiar language, we might say. These have not yet been translated, uh, but uh, uh, everything, everything is an, uh, ahead of us. We are also extremely lucky uh, at the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation that Ferenc sits on our advisory board. So he, we are particularly well suited to take advantage uh, of his um, uh, uh, expert views on all the topics uh, which he studies. So thank you again, Ferenc, for uh, accepting this invitation. Thank you, Nikolai. If you allow me just to update you uh, on, on, on my affiliation, because uh, of course. you need to know the, the, the last version, which is that uh, I direct uh, the Research Institute of Politics and Government of the University of Public Service in, in Budapest. And now I, I, I finished the, directing the Institute of Philosophy, where I remained a senior fellow. So that's ah, and well, I left uh, uh, Pazmani as well. So a uh, little changes, uh, but but Budapest is the same. A former a former director uh, in that case, the Institute of Philosophy of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and currently a senior fellow at the said at the said uh, academy. Uh, so, <laughs> in a way, all the prestige remains, and yet is um, in a way uh, augmented. So thank you again. And uh, jumping straight in, I just wanted to start with uh, cultural conservative identity in Central and Eastern Europe, and particularly in Hungary, as this is um, a very interesting topic, especially given the turbulent history of the region. So there is a dilemma, we might say, uh, about what to appeal to when defining one's cultural identity, as, uh, especially as a conservative in Central and Eastern Europe, as on the one hand, um, Central and Eastern European intellectuals naturally want to claim their right to the wider European cultural heritage, uh, which they were, of course, denied 
during communism. Uh, but on the other hand, there is an equally strong need uh, and an equally pressing one um, to assert local identity, which of course was also under pressure from a communist idea of homogenization of culture. And these two points of reference are in a way or to a degree in tension, uh, because of course one influences the local aspect of culture and the other one uh, influences a broader uh, cross-border aspect of culture and identity. So this tension, it seems in recent years has been accentuated in the politics in most C states. There is a certain dynamic of uh, 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 pitting one against the other in various contexts. So I just wanted to ask you as a person who writes broadly on those issues and has a keen interest, especially in the perspective of Hungary in that particular uh, uh, problem, uh, what is the source of this? Uh, and can we hope for a resolution? Can we hope for a reconciliation of these two elements uh, that the identity of Central and Eastern European culture appeals to? Well, uh, that's, that's a very profound question and uh, a lot uh, to consider about it. Let me let put it this way, my, my uh, understanding or my approach to the, the question. I don't see here a dilemma. What I see is a tension. Let me explain. I think that uh, uh, for uh, me at least, and I want to speak always for myself, uh, that's, that's the best uh, I know. Uh, so uh, I myself identify myself both as a European and as a Central European. And I don't think that's uh, an either or question. Uh, and don't think there is a, a schism in me for that. On the contrary, I think that the two go very well in hand. Uh, why? Because Central Europe is in Europe. So uh, you define first, uh, 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 you know, a, a region, a locality, Central Europe, and then uh, you see uh, where that uh, locality lies, and that's uh, in Europe, and uh, uh, lying there both geographically and culturally. But you are right that there is a tension. Uh, I agree with that. And that's because of politics and because of the culture war that is uh, uh, so permanent uh, these years uh, uh, since, uh, I don't know. Uh, and uh, I think that that tension uh, can be traced back. You know, we uh, Central Europeans like to trace back things in history. And I would like to trace back this tension to at least the Second World War, when Western Europe had to uh, make a decision how to uh, handle uh, uh, the uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, uh, Pact, which uh, 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 was, uh, you know, uh, endangering the whole of Europe. Uh, Stalin and Hitler uh, uh, shaking hands and uh, and taking over uh, the whole of Europe. And the West decided to go uh, with St Stalin against Hitler. So divide and, and uh, uh, rule. They, they wanted to take Stalin on board and uh, they uh, could uh, this way win over Hitler. But the result was that uh, at almost half of the, of the uh, uh, continent was lost to Stalin uh, under a communist regime. And uh, to live uh, under a communist regime for decades uh, you know, transforms uh, ways of thinking uh, and in fact traumatizes societies. Th this is a totalitarian regime, we tend to forget, but communism is a totalitarian ideology and uh, uh, this part of Europe had to uh, uh, suffer that and that uh, 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 distorted uh, much of its uh, mentality. On the other hand, Western uh, Europe has also its uh, identity problem. So you uh, could ask mm -hmm. the same uh, question about Western Europe, how uh, European Western Europe is uh, right now. And I think that uh, one of the problems, uh, the identity problem, which is, uh, you know, in the news uh, these days uh, in London or, or, or Paris or wherever you go in the West, uh, is that uh, uh, Western intellectuals did not uh, 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 learned a lesson, disregarded the lessons of a communist past in Europe. 
And I think that's a, a lesson that they have to uh, work out as uh, we sent in Central Europe have to uh, heal our um, uh, traumatized uh, uh, communal selves. That's how I see the problem, the tension. Mm. Well, there's, that's, that's very interesting. So uh, uh, part of my, part of, uh, my question uh, uh, was uh, based on the assumption that in Western Europe, in a way, the uh, identity that's grounded in European culture is a bit more homogenous in that uh, the common heritage is understood as something that uh, can still be drawn upon and that's something that is still alive and available uh, as uh, uh, a continued, as it were, project that is still embodied in some way. That's because I, I think because, because you are still based on the old paradigm and that was true in the old paradigm, uh, uh, in the paradigm of the uh, pre-1990 uh, scenario, uh, in, the, in the Cold War uh, scenario, when, when the mm. West was united against uh, uh, communism in a certain way, at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, on the official uh, uh, files. On the other hand, uh, Western intellectuals already then uh, were, you know, uh, many of them after 68, uh, uh, still uh, preserving um, their uh, sympathy with, with, uh, with, uh, with um, the communist uh, uh, ideology, and that's that's uh, that was an inherent problem uh, for them as well, I guess. Mm. Mm. So there's a there's a way to turn this question around and appeal to uh, a book you just recently published, uh, uh, the political philosophy of the European city, um, which deals with the periphery. Ah, you've got it right there. Uh, excellent. Um, so 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 the book deals with uh, the periphery of Europe and how that is able to contribute to European identity. So we might wonder in the East how um, we might appeal to uh, Euro the, the Western European identity or the elements of Western European culture that constitute our identity without contradicting those aspects of our, our identity that are locally constituted. But we might turn this question around and ask what the West has, um, uh, uh, what debt it has in its own identity to uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, there are, of course, many important points in history that can be um, uh, singled out as something that has influenced the history of Western Europe. But culturally, uh, do you think that uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe now can contribute as valuably to the European identity as they did um, in those times when, um, for example, uh, 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 Central and Eastern Europe were the place where uh, Christianity had its border uh, against the rest, the rest of the world. Uh, or we that... could mention the Habsburg Empire, which was uh, uh, quite an influential player uh, on the European uh, uh, arena and, uh, and uh, still, um, you know, uh, appreciating differences within the region and, uh, and uh, giving it uh, um, uh, a European uh, 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 institutional framework. So I think that uh, we, we, we uh, here uh, have to reconsider the Habsburg um, uh, legacy uh, and, and see how uh, our cultures are both, uh, uh, you know, united by that uh, common uh, uh, history, but also how uh, it appreciated our differences. And, and I think that's, that's a, a lesson which is quite important. As for my for the the the, the basic question, uh, Central Europe or uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, as as you uh, put it, uh, and uh, Europe generally, I think that uh, it's important uh, to uh, incorporate into uh, the European identity um, uh, the communist past, and I think that uh, this needs to be done uh, on a regular basis, uh, uh, as it was. Uh, with, with, uh, with the Nazi past, uh, uh, because these are two totalitarian regimes which happened in the center of Europe. And uh, we uh, are uh, in many ways, uh, not only the victims of it, but also responsible for it. Uh, so in a way, um, we have to uh, consider that. On, a, on the other hand, uh, I think so. So I think uh, there is a, a need for work on both sides. If there is a tension, 
uh, the healing can come only if, if both uh, sides uh, would uh, add their own uh, 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 lessons uh, learned uh, into the package. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, uh, European uh, ideologists and uh, 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 media uh, uh, influencers uh, should uh, consider the fact that uh, uh, these traumatized societies which we have here uh, are traumatized because of the historical uh, circumstances that uh, uh, caused them. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, it was um, uh, um, a great power decision uh, uh, at, the, at the outbreak of the first world, uh, Second World War. And that's uh, uh, a lesson uh, which needs to be considered that the West, uh, 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 you know, avoided uh, uh, those traumas uh, and, uh, and we did not. So uh, we have got different, uh, different uh, experiential horizons. And it takes time uh, to heal that, I think, and it, it needs effort uh, to, to, to heal that. Uh, and I think that the efforts now go to the contrary direction, to culture war, actually. Um, let me just mention before we continue that uh, we're, we'll be taking questions from the audience at the end of this interview. So if you um, want to pick up on something uh, that Ferenc and I are discussing and ask uh, particularly Ferenc, uh, for uh, some more of his thoughts on that topic, please uh, just put your question in the comments uh, and I will address it to Ferenc at the end of the interview um, during, during the Q&A. So move, moving on, uh, this is, this is uh, an extremely interesting point that you make about the positive aspect of uh, the communist heritage. Uh, Roger Scruton wrote about the problem of mourning for the uh, lost German culture that was tarnished for the subsequent generations by the fact that the Nazis drew on that culture for inspiration for their own, um, for forging their own identity. Uh, but there is a more innocent way in which the communist era also forged the identity uh, of Central and Eastern Europe and which is also under threat, namely, uh, uh, the, the, uh, to appeal to the topic of this interview, the life of the mind in communist Europe was led in an atmosphere of fear and isolation. There was state prosecution, of course, for anyone who dared to think otherwise than the party line uh, commanded. Um, and in those circumstances, uh, feelings like trust carried weight uh, and friendships were meaningful in a way um, that had depth which is sometimes hard to uh, imagine now. And with the turn, it seems that also this interpersonal uh, dependency or dependence, which was emphasized under the communist regime, the reality of those bonds is something that people are quick to throw away uh, with the dangers uh, uh, of, of communism. Once these have been overcome, it seems that lots of people or the societies in Central and Eastern Europe no longer feel the need to support those virtues that uh, were able to sustain the culture of Central and Eastern Europe, even through those dark times. So it seems there is a danger that the culture of Central and Eastern Europe uh, is being threatened by, uh, that is paradoxically a result of the disappearance of communism and the pressure under which that culture was uh, uh, forced to survive. Um, so uh, the question is whether or not uh, there are now in Central and Eastern Europe and particularly in Hungary, uh, natural communities of thought, uh, which are candidates for, for sustaining that local culture in spite of the fact that there is no more the pressure to do so. In a way, uh, conservatives have it easy in the West because, uh, or had it easier uh, in the West in the 90s, because uh, that was the beginning of the great culture wars. Uh, here, uh, capitalism was uh, anything anyone cared about in many places. So is it something that we can resist? Uh, and uh, where would you see um, uh, a fertile ground for uh, regrowing uh, what, is, what is under threat culturally? Yes, uh, I agree with you, Mikolai. I think your description is valid. Uh, 
uh, our uh, nations, both uh, Hungary and Poland and, and um, the other ones uh, in this region, uh, were living under political pressure, uh, you know, directed uh, uh, straight from uh, Moscow. And political pressure brings people together. It's, it's just the physics of, uh, of uh, politics, so to say. Uh, even if there are, you know, huge dramas, uh, people can uh, uh, betray others uh, and, and, and um, uh, the system, as we call it, uh, would do everything in, in, in their, their power to, to let, uh, uh, let us uh, betray our best friends and, and, uh, and uh, allies and relatives even. You know, uh, the, the totalitarian uh, regime has uh, just uh, one single uh, innovation to enter the intimate sphere of, uh, of uh, people. That's what it is meant by totalitarianism. Uh, you cannot trust your father, for example. See the, the example of uh, the writer Esterházy, uh, Peter, a uh, famous Hungarian writer who had to rewrite one of his uh, greatest books, because at the end of when he put down the pen, uh, it came out that the father picture he had was wrong uh, uh, historically, because his father was uh, uh, a secret agent of, of the communists. So you cannot trust even your father. He had to rewrite the story uh, with a uh, with, um, uh, rewritten version of his uh, father. And you cannot uh, trust uh, your close friends, uh, even among intellectuals. Uh, See the example of the writer Shandor Tar, who was uh, coming from a working ground, uh, uh, working class background, and becoming a, a famous writer. Uh, one who was thought that well, he might be against the, uh, much of uh, the communist propaganda. And uh, at the end of the day, it turned out that uh, Shandor Tar was also a secret agent. So the whole uh, atmosphere is poisoned, as, uh, as Shakespeare would put it. So I think uh, that's, that's, uh, that's not so easy, even the, this uh, 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 claim that political pressure brings people together. But on the whole, uh, if you uh, take uh, numerically or, or statistically, you can uh, argue that, uh, that uh, pressure helps uh, to, to, to bring cohesion uh, into a community see the Catholic Church and its effect in, in Poland. On the other hand, I think that, uh, that, uh, that freedom has its, uh, uh, its, its uh, fruits and, and offers for uh, a community, even if there are challenges and temptations that, uh, that we have to um, uh, uh, take into account. And I think that uh, uh, a long enough freedom will uh, bring with it uh, uh, experiences that uh, that uh, we can work together and it's better if we work together than uh, against each other. I think that, uh, well, perhaps it sounds a bit like um, uh, a dogmatic claim, but I think that that uh, actually, if you look at uh, uh, the Western European e uh, example, it exactly uh, uh, is a proof of that, i.e. that uh, people learned, think about uh, 17th century Holland, one of my reference points uh, in, in my uh, narratives, both in, in my uh, book on conservatism, uh, the political philosophy of uh, conservatism, and in this uh, uh, city book of mine. Uh, 17th century Dutch uh, experience is an experience of local cultures uh, that, uh, that work together and uh, make uh, the whole region uh, uh, not only rich, but also having self-esteem and, uh, and uh, exercising uh, uh, local governance and, uh, and uh, a full uh, political life in the Aristotelian sense. And I think that, uh, that it's available everywhere if there is enough uh, space and time for that. And I, and I only hope that we will have uh, enough time for that. You cannot um, ch change drastically um, people's mentality and uh, even less uh, um, you know, customs uh, and, and habits. It takes time to, to uh, bring them forth and, and you can destroy it very fast as, as uh, one of um, Scruton's famous uh, uh, quotes uh, uh, suggests. Uh, so I think that we need time and we need uh, patience. And I think that Europe is in a way uh, committing uh, a, a very drastic mistake when uh, they want to teach these regions uh, how democracy actually works. 
partly because, uh, well, uh, some of these countries have long histories of, uh, of constitutional uh, governance. Uh, I uh, co-edited a volume on, on the Hungarian constitutional tradition, which uh, claims to go back to uh, hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of years of uh, history. And uh, partly because uh, you cannot uh, teach democracy, you have to experience it uh, as on a trial and error basis yourself. That's the only way to do it. Of course, uh, you can support uh, those efforts, but I think that, um, that in a way, you know, uh, teaching democracy as was the uh, American habit uh, some decades ago uh, is uh, sometimes counter, uh, you know, uh, productive uh, and the same uh, is happening right now uh, uh, on the side of the European Union. Uh, they, they think that they know the clue uh, to, to our problems and they, they uh, simply uh, seem to be impatient with, with us uh, uh, finding that, that clue. Mm. So, fantastic. Yes, uh, I completely agree with that. Um, but there's a question about what group in the society or where should society look for the vessel to sustain its core values? Um, so we might say, as you in a way argue uh, in your paper about the Hungarian middle classes, which I want to appeal to, I found that paper extremely uh, interesting, uh, that uh, the uh, social group that was responsible for uh, the most vibrant development of, of uh, Hungarian culture and Hungarian identity, uh, at least before the First World War, were, were the middle classes. And these were exactly the middle class, the, 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 the social group that was targeted by communists. They hated the idea of, the priv of private property on which that class, of course, developed. They hated the bourgeois culture of that class, um, which private property and affluence uh, made possible uh, by engagement, by, create, by the creation of free time and engagement with the things uh, uh, produced by the human mind that were usually reserved for, for aristocracy. But the middle classes survived this oppression by what you call double education. Of course, anyone in Central and Eastern Europe is familiar with double education. There is the official education that you get from the state, and there is the education that you get at home and through various secret channels that you cannot reveal. And uh, receiving that secret education, of course, forges friendship uh, and intellectual bonds with people um, who are in the same position. And throughout the communist period, the culture of Central and Eastern Europe, of Hungary and Poland, was possible to sustain and uh, 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 save secretly despite everything what was happening in the, in the official uh, culture and the official languages. And so after communism, there was, uh, for example, in Poland, um, uh, a remarkable uh, uh, phenomenon of uh, the appearance of great many local uh, uh, folk music bands. Uh, the communist idea was to have a pan-Polish uh, uh, folk culture. Uh, which of course was completely fabricated out of bits and pieces of folk cultures of the various regions of Poland. But these were preserved in secret and they re-emerged after 89 in various ways. But it was in a way a short-lived phenomenon. It seems that the return of private property and the return of the luxury of time that uh, the middle classes were able to develop in the 19th century hasn't seen a return of the middle classes to the mantle of the uh, social group responsible for the development of the cultural identity uh, of the nations of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so do we need to look to the middle classes and change something in how the middle classes function and rep represent this role in our societies? Or must we look to another group? Maybe the middle classes are a thing of the past in the way that they were defined before. Uh, or maybe there is still some way for them to resume their role of the broad cultural education uh, uh, and the st standards of cultural engagement. Uh, so so well, that's a question to you. <laughs> uh, very, very, very great uh, uh, and large uh, scale uh, perspective that one has to uh, uh, confront here, I think. Uh, first of all, uh, bourgeoisie 
is something that needs to be distinguished in this context, I think, uh, from the middle classes. Because mm -hmm. in Hungary, there was no bourgeoisie in the French sense of the term, uh, i.e. Uh, a strong commercial uh, and industrial interest. Uh, uh, if there was one, uh, which was the case uh, in the, in the uh, dual monarchist period from, uh, uh, the, uh, from the uh, settlement in uh, 1867 until the First World War, that was uh, partly Jewish, actually. And uh, that you have to be aware that um, uh, Hungarian urban uh, culture is partly German, partly Jewish, and uh, only a, a small scale uh, Hungarian. That's, uh, that's a specificity of our history. And you have to understand that uh, uh, Hungarian um, uh, constitutional life was in the hands of the nobility. It, you, have, you don't have to explain this um, uh, to a Polish uh, a uh, friend like uh, Mikolai, because uh, he knows what I mean. But uh, I think that uh, that um, uh, people in the US would uh, would uh, easily forget that uh, this is, uh, you know, a, a traditional society with uh, with uh, with the uh, nobility in in rule until the First World War, actually. So what happens is that uh, uh, the nobility has to give way to what was called the Christian middle classes, where the Christian, the term Christian was opposed to the Jewish or, or foreign uh, middle classes. Uh, it was also called historical middle classes. But uh, I myself uh, come from a, a German uh, family, as my name uh, uh, shows. And I, I, I uh, see uh, uh, this perspective a little bit different from the uh, historians or the historiography in, in Hungary. And I would claim that the middle classes uh, no matter whether they were the Christian middle classes or the Jewish uh, and foreign middle classes to which I belonged or my family belonged, both of them represented something very important in the uh, political culture of the country. And that's, uh, and I will uh, use here a, a long uh, German word, Bildung, Bildungsbürgerlichkeit. That's, uh, that's uh, the idea uh, that is uh, so important for, for uh, Roger as well, that uh, culture, uh, uh, can become a uh, political power and more so in a context uh, when, uh, when actual political practice is uh, censured or, or uh, impossible for different reasons, uh, for a for foreign uh, uh, king, for example, who is uh, 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 not uh, um, uh, supporting the idea that, that you run your country constitutionally or um, uh, for other reasons like um, uh, poverty, po poverty and, and, and uh, things like that. So I think that the important thing that the Bildungsbürgerliche, uh, so the, 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 the uh, middle class is uh, built on uh, culture that uh, played a major role uh, in Hungarian history. And, and that's what was destroyed uh, by the communists. So that's what I tried to explain in that paper. And I think that it connects to Roger's uh, uh, stress on civil society. When he came to, to Central Europe in the 80s, what he tried to do is to encourage, uh, you know, civil uh, uh, participation, civil activity, which was forbidden, of course, and therefore not many people uh, uh, actually uh, found the, the idea appealing. But uh, uh, he made efforts. Uh, he, he was invited to small circles of students, of um, intellectuals, but also to ordinary people's uh, uh, discussion groups. And, and that's uh, how he tried to spread the idea that uh, society is more than politics uh, in a certain sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, he is referring to the Hegelian scheme, uh, which is a three-partite uh, system. The, 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 the elementary society is uh, family. That's, that's the most important, that's what uh, you are born in. Then there is this larger scheme of uh, families and, uh, and small societies called civil society, which is actually the flesh and blood of, 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 your, uh, uh, of your nation. And then there is the state, uh, which for Hegel is, is the all important, but uh, in the British tradition, it's less important. Uh, and, and here the point that I want to refer to is that civil society uh, is a major force against the totalitarian temptation as well as against uh, uh, capitalist consumerism because civil society uh, presents values 
which are important in many respects, including um, the value of beauty, which uh, is a crucial term uh, uh, for uh, Scruton. Uh, think about architecture, how ugly uh, uh, the Eastern European, uh, Central Eastern European uh, cities became during those years. And, and that's something that you have to change, but it takes time. Again, I have to confess. I wanted to touch on beauty, actually, um, uh, because I think this is a, a closely connected question. So, as you say, um, European cities, Central and Eastern European cities during communism became uh, famously ugly uh, with the uh, massive um, uh, blocks of flats, the concrete towers and so on. But it seems that beauty had not come back to the region. As, as Gisław Krasnodemski writes in his very short paper, which he wrote for the Polish Philosophical Review after Roger's death. Uh, Roger's philosophy was mainly received, at least in Poland, uh, as a statement of his political ideas and ideals, uh, whereas the side of his philosophy, which was based in aesthetics, was less urgently, um, uh, was viewed with less interest because it was less urgent. People thought that the questions of politics need to be settled first and the questions of how to live under this regime and finally overthrow it. And then we might look at beauty later. But arguably, this has never happened. Uh, I mean, to me, I, I, I live in Poland and it seems to me that by comparison, of course, unless they're painted in these awful pastel colors, which they sometimes acquire over time when people may want to make them more jolly, uh, the blocks of flats that, uh, you know, the, the big concrete slabs are in a way a little bit better than the postmodern chaos of, of the uh, city suburb that is now sprawling everywhere. Uh, even if you look at the renovated city centers, it seems to me that in Krakow or Prague, uh, the, the, the renovated parts are becoming more and more tourist theme parks where the indigenous population doesn't live anymore, but all of the streets are rented out on B Airbnbs and have none of the facilities that a local population would need to use, but are filled with tourist tat from store window to store window. Uh, well, the countryside, as I said, is being ravished by uh, uh, absolutely atrocious development. So in a way, beauty was not a concern then, uh, but it's even less in a way a concern now. The topic hasn't resurfaced, I think. Uh, and I think this is connected with, with the middle classes because I don't see the middle classes, uh, even though they were able to retain their role of the torchbearers of culture, of those who naturally think it is worthwhile to read the forbidden books and gather in small circles where you have to trust the other person. Uh, you don't see them gathering now, I think. Uh, and because they don't, they also don't worry about anything uh, outside of their own immediate um, uh, world. So as long as um, what is in their own domain looks okay, they're not interested in the rest of the street and so on. And that creates the uh, aesthetic chaos uh, of Central and Eastern Europe that anyone who wanders out of the historic city center will see. So how can we bring back beauty in Central and Eastern Europe? It seems that the transformation itself wasn't enough. Well, uh, again, a large question. Uh, let me start from, uh, from Immanuel Kant, um, uh, who was uh, one of the favorites of, of Roger claiming that the beauty is a symbol of uh, uh, moral values of the good. Uh, uh, the external uh, appearance of, of that internal um, uh, uh, value. And if um, we have what uh, traumatized so societies, as I argued, well, how could we expect that uh, the external side of it would be so beautiful? So I think it expresses ourselves, our inner selves, our uh, you know, spiritual life, uh, the life of our mind in that uh, sense. So we have to, uh, you know, uh, to heal our, our uh, wounds, uh, historical wounds, and that, that, that may uh, be done only, uh, you know, slow process. But, uh, but there, are, there are directions that, that might help. One of them is uh, uh, not to look only uh, on the metropolitan areas, but uh, uh, on the small cities or the middle-sized cities. I uh, edited a volume uh, 
uh, with the title In Praise of the Small Town, which I think is a crucial issue. Uh, we think that, uh, that uh, all the developments are towards, um, uh, you know, central metropolitan areas or, uh, or the megalopolis. But that's not true. Most of the people live uh, not in those areas. They live uh, in urban areas, but uh, in the countryside. So we have to take care of them. And uh, I would like to see more um, uh, activity on that side. But I already see some of it, at least in, in Hungary. We have got uh, these uh, local communities, local preservation societies, uh, or, or uh, things like that, uh, which try to uh, you know, find uh, 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 historical uh, documents of, of their city centers, of their uh, cemeteries, of their uh, 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 local uh, iconic uh, buildings, and try to, to, to build, uh, to, to find resources to, to rebuild them and reconstruct uh, them. And there is already a discussion whether that can be done or is, is it a, a, a historical um, uh, lie. And of course, uh, Roger would say that, well, don't uh, don't uh, believe those uh, uh, people who would say that well uh, time is over and uh, you have to forget the beautiful buildings no uh, beautiful buildings have um, their appeal even today if you ask ordinary people they would uh, immediately say so so uh, there is uh, here a ground and i think uh, roger himself um, uh, showed the example when he uh, accepted um, uh, the, the, the conservative government's uh, invitation to, to chair the, the Building Better, Be Building Beautiful uh, Commission, uh, which uh, uh, had one single uh, uh, idea, which is this. Uh, you only have to find the right regulations and then all the other things will come from civil society. Uh, the state should not uh, decide what to build and, and, and uh, control it and monopolize on it. But you have to accept uh, regulations because regulations will determine uh, the, the boundaries, the, 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 the constraints, the limits to beauty. Because uh, um, uh, Roger uh, shared this uh, uh, classical idea of beauty that it, it is, you know, the Eliot, uh, T.S. Eliot uh, kind of uh, uh, concept of beauty, which says that beauty is uh, uh, defined by, by boundaries, by, by the limits uh, to it. Uh, that's, that's what gives it uh, cohesion and, and uh, perfection. So I think that uh, we should follow in that respect uh, 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 Roger's example, and not only you know, intellectuals, but, but also intellectuals who uh, you know, generally think uh, of themselves as well, uh, solving the great uh, uh, philosophical problems of, of uh, uh, eternity, instead of, you know, working on the local level for the, the betterment of, of, of their own society. Scruton very, very nicely describes uh, when he discovers uh, uh, the legacy of his own father, who was actually not an easy person and a um, very uh, 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 constrained um, uh, relationship uh, existed between uh, him and, and, and Roger. But at, at a, a later uh, uh, point of, of his life here, he recognized the fact that, uh, that his father uh, uh, understood what uh, the beauty of, of uh, uh, England means. And that's what uh, uh, he uh, strived for on the local level, uh, standing uh, at the corner of uh, the square and uh, sharing uh, ideas with the local people and, and collecting uh, uh, signatures for, for uh, good causes. So I think there is uh, here uh, a niche uh, to, uh, to fulfill, and I think uh, we uh, intellectuals can, uh, can uh, also uh, contribute to that. Mm. That's definitely true. I want to just pursue that point slightly further, but before I do, I just want to remind um, all of those listening in that um, we're soon approaching question time, so if you've got something uh, that you'd like to address to Ferenc, please send it in the comments. Uh, and I'll convey the question and discuss it with uh, um, with our guest tonight. Um, but I just wanted to um, say that, of course, uh, I completely agree. Uh, but there is also a different type of um, uh, uh, aesthetic uh, taste. Uh, there is the natural preference for things that are beautiful, which we all, to an extent, recognize. 
and we all know when we're being cheated uh, and presented something that is not beautiful, but only a clever gimmick and told that we have to appreciate it. But there's also another kind of uh, aesthetic appreciation, which um, like Schiller suggested, flows from an aesthetic education, something that we have to learn in order to be able to appreciate aesthetically. This is of course now an extremely controversial idea that you can educate taste, but it's absolutely crucial because of course there is only so much that you can do based on this natural inclination for things that we like. Uh, because of course, I think that uh, an, an unaided sense of uh, taste can come up with uh, things that sometimes are the right thing to decide uh, to, to like and sometimes can lead us astray. And this is why aesthetic education is so important. Um, and it's, it's a question and it's an open question where it should come from uh, in the, in, in the um, current society in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, on the one hand, you might say it's enough for the government to just set the uh, uh, right regulations and then uh, the decision of how to fill these forms will come from the, from the bottom and just do it naturally. But on the other hand, it seems that since we have lost the uh, uh, aristocratic elites, which in a way uh, uh, gave a standard of taste to the rest of society, uh, there, is, there is a need for something to appeal to. Uh, for that standard of taste, and no replacement seems to be forthcoming. And this is part of uh, the problem with the uh, Central and Eastern European suburb and uh, the sort of, uh, you know, theme park city centre. Uh, the conservation societies in the West have it a little easier, in a way, uh, because uh, uh, there's more left in the West to preserve than there is in the East. Uh, the East needs to do, in a way, more work, uh, and someone needs to uh, produce the standard. Uh, and so, uh, hence my question about the role of the middle classes, or whether that role was spent. So, who, who is now not only the person teaching, because we might appeal to Roger as one of the teachers who we can, who we can identify, but who is the group receiving that education and carrying it forward? Uh, in, in your well, view. You were very critical of the middle classes in the article that I quoted, uh, and, and you didn't give a clear, so this is why my, I, I'm so interested in this, because you didn't give a clear, either a clear alternative or a clear path to um, uh, the, the um, reestablishing of the middle classes as uh, uh, the social group uh, that is the recipient of, of, of those lessons and a setter of the standard. That's uh, you, you, you. You are right, Nikolai. I'm, I, I'm, you know, uh, a fragile uh, writer, and of course, there are no straightforward. There are no straightforward uh, uh, answers to this question. I think this is uh, the issue of the day. So we have to each contribute to to it and and try to find it out. Uh, uh, how we will reach? I think my ideal in this respect is uh, uh, the small German city. If you travel around the Germany and, and you have got your uh, uh, hotel room and go down to the uh, market square, which is uh, also the, the main square where the, 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 the cathedral uh, or the church uh, stands, and people are discussing um, the politics there or just uh, ordinary human affairs, uh, you know, making love with each other and so on and so on. I think that's the ideal scenario for a European way of life. But how to reach that? Well, Germany was destroyed because of itself and because of the Second World War, and and they arrived back. I think that's that's partly because they have got different traditions and they found the right tradition to 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 lie, to rely on and and uh, to, to try to get rid of the wrong tradition. And I think that this choice is there uh, for each individual and for each community, you see. Uh, th there is no mm. predetermination in this. We can, uh, we can find our uh, you know, historical uh, cultural background. And in this respect, uh, we intellectuals have um, uh, serious responsibilities. We think that, well, uh, you know, this, um, uh, humanities guys, they are just uh, thinking uh, nonsense and, and, uh, 
and um, uh, wild ideas and, and uh, uh, favoring uh, art which is meaningful and under ununderstandable. But that's not uh, uh, our only uh, uh, alternative. There is a, another one, which is uh, uh, to try to teach and try to learn. Uh, what I did for a quarter of a century was teaching uh, aesthetics, the philosophy of art, mm. uh, the Catholic university. And of course, Catholic education has a, a tradition in my region, as in your one, as in, uh, in the whole of Europe, actually. The Enlightenment would not come uh, without the Jesuits. Uh, you should not forget about that. So uh, there is this uh, tradition of uh, teaching the liberal arts. And I think that's, uh, that's a topic which is uh, true both in the US and in, in Europe. You have to teach your own tradition. And uh, the liberal arts uh, curriculum is about uh, your own uh, tradition. And as soon as uh, uh, you try to push it through, uh, uh, because uh, first, you know, you take uh, Homer and it's, it's unreadable, you think it's not Harry Potter. Uh, so you have to make efforts. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but without efforts, you will not uh, have enjoyment. That's, that's, that's the point. And so you, you have to get through this, uh, this initiation process, I think. But, uh, but there, is a, there is a possibility uh, to do that. And I think that, uh, that Roger's, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, not argument, but Roger's uh, uh, message is that, that uh, it's not uh, uh, only for the elite, but there is a, a task for the elite. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, conservatism, the, 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 the idea, idea of a, a society that I uh, uh, assume is the best one, uh, even if it's not a perfect one, uh, assumes that there is a need for an elite, uh, but the elite is not against society and it's not independent of society. It is responsible for society. So that's a responsibility uh, on our uh, shoulders uh, that uh, we uh, know languages, we, we, we have uh, uh, done our uh, pensums, our uh, readings, and now we have to write, we have to teach, we have to share ideas, and we have to engage in, in, in public debate. Uh, we do not have to be afraid to, to discuss issues even if I'm not uh, in favor of uh, warring on culture. I think mm. that's a different uh, idea. You have to, uh, you have to uh, do it uh, for your own development and the development of your own community, not uh, against uh, uh, someone or against uh, another community. Mm. So you would say that the, the, the role is uh, something that uh, the uh, intellectual humanists uh, will, will fill uh, of... of yes. uh, Maybe they, that will not be not enough, but there is, a, a, you know, a mission here. Uh, there is a, a responsibility here. There is a, a, a task that we cannot avoid to do, uh, to, to confront uh, and, and to take on. I think um, otherwise, uh, you know, we uh, received a lot of money from, uh, from our uh, state uh, and, and the state gets it from the taxes of the individuals. So our society paid a lot to us uh, to learn uh, uh, and to, to, to cultivate our mind. So we have to pay that back uh, by, by, by serving our societies, the local ones, as well as uh, um, the, the larger one. Uh, I think these are you know, layers that, that uh, uh, build on each other uh, quite naturally. Mm. Well, there is there is a, a difficulty for at least the conservative-minded uh, person there, uh, uh, because you mentioned that part of this effort is referring to examples of the past or certain aspects that are constitutive of our identity that come from our from our past, uh, and this is this is of course characteristically conservative. Um, the, the the liberals like to be united in looking forward into the future and expecting. Uh, some some goal that they aim to uh, bring about um, uh, forming, uh, whereas conservatives want to preserve something. But that is a that can be a divisive issue, especially in a big nation state, because different groups will orient themselves or appeal to different elements of that history. And this is especially true um, in Central and Eastern Europe, which had uh, a very complex history, not only communism, but pre-communist uh, developments in the region um, are uh, 
in a way uh, uh, more complex than in the West, I would say. Uh, so uh, of course, the, the, the staple uh, example of this is for Hungary, the appeal to uh, the uh, borders of Hungary pre uh, the treaty in Trianon, uh, where Hungary was of course taken, taken apart and deprived of all its ring, ring cities and left only with one big Budapest city. But appealing to that heritage also, also has its tensions and problems because it won't unite the whole of, of uh, society over that ideal. So looking back into the past only, uh, seems to have this danger of being divisive in, in, in society. It certainly has proven divisive in Poland, uh, where of course this is, this is one of the goals of the current government to look back into the past for the, the, uh, uh, the elements of uh, Polish identity, which we can uh, identify there, but not everyone accepts those elements in particular that, that, that the government wants to point to. This underlines, of course, the difficulty you said that you know uh, trying to fill in the framework um, is is possibly not a good idea. Relying on civic society might be better. Um, I think I think uh, Mik Mikhail uh, that, that there are two points. One is that uh, I don't share that uh, your view that that uh, the West is in an easier situation in that. If you mm. look at at uh, those. Mm. Uh, um, culture of war debate, uh, the woke uh, culture or cancel culture and all that. The imperial past is uh, a burden which um, the West has not yet uh, uh, confronted and which is there to, to deal with. So I don't, I don't envy that. Uh, so they have got uh, their problems, but of course everyone uh, is uh, more sensitive. We are more sensitive for our own problems and we don't see the, the problems of the others as well as, as uh, ours. And, and I agree with that. We have got these um, divisive issues. Uh, in, in Hungarian history in the 20th century, we have got three traumas. Trianon, which you mentioned, when, uh, when the two thirds of the territory and one third of the population was lost, which is uh, quite a lot. Then um, we have got uh, the Holocaust, uh, which uh, uh, was partly, uh, uh, you know, uh, supported by the Hungarian state as well as uh, parts of Hungarian society, uh, while uh, the, the, the victims were also uh, parts of that very society. So that's the second trauma. And the third one is uh, 56, uh, the, the communist uh, revolution and its um, uh, 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 destruction by, by, by the Soviet tanks. Uh, and who uh, were actually, you, whose legacy it is. And I think that you cannot avoid to, to, to discuss all these. You have to get through them. Uh, yes, it's divisive, but uh, you, you know, mm. uh, when, when the 17th century uh, Dutch, uh, 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 you know, traders and, and, and town council members uh, discussed issues uh, whether to, to follow um, uh, the, uh, the Orange House or, or whatever other direction, they were divided as well. Uh, politics divides, but we, uh, we cannot uh, uh, live without uh, those uh, discussions uh, and you cannot hope for a, a, a peaceful uh, uh, um, city because I, I consider a political community a city in the uh, police sense or the uh, civitas sense uh, without uh, the division discussed. You have to uh, uh, see the pros and contras and you have to find a modus vivendi. That's, that's the art of politics. And of course the modus vivendi will always change uh, with generation after generation. And we have to uh, uh, learn our lessons from uh, history but not for its own sake. What we learn from history is how to tackle uh, the present. And in this respect, uh, my, my most important uh, virtue, uh, the Christian cardinal virtue of prudence. And prudence uh, means uh, to tackle uh, uh, the, the, the issues of the day with uh, uh, the knowledge of the past, with the experience that you um, uh, inherited and also uh, with the cultural uh, uh, package of your community. And that's the way to tackle the, the present. And, we, and that's where you can um, uh, start to think about uh, future plans uh, uh, with, with that uh, already in your uh, package. Mm. 
Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, uh, that's 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 excellent. Uh, I've uh, hogged hogged your attention for for for, for long enough. While well, we have uh, time for a couple more questions uh, from from the audience, um, which we did receive in the meantime, uh, I thought I thought it was uh, a, an excellent discussion. But let's give the voice to uh, some of some of the participants. Uh, uh, that have joined us today. So the first question will be from Samuel um, Leonard uh, from the UK, uh, who asks, uh, what do you think of those of us in Western Europe, uh, what, what we could learn, uh, uh, could we learn the most from Hungary right now, or while Hungary grew from, the, uh, uh, from post the 90s period in terms of civil society and government? Uh, do you think that governments such as Westminster and the UK miss out on any uh, 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 on anything that is useful uh, in uh, in the East, particularly in Hungary? Well, I think uh, actually uh, Britain is uh, uh, right now on, on friendly terms with Hungary as opposed to many other European uh, states. So I think uh, the distance is not so far in that respect. And actually Hungarians... Uh, used to be proud that they have got a, an unwritten constitution ju just like uh, uh, the Brits had. But I think that uh, uh, there are two dangers. One is uh, to, to uh, you know, regard Eastern Europe as, uh, as a barbarous uh, periphery, which, uh, which needs to be taught uh, by, by the, the cultivated uh, elites of our uh, um, of European uh, 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 countries. The other danger is uh, uh, to overestimate uh, uh, that value. I think that we is in Eastern Europe have a certain Eastern European hubris. And that's, uh, that's uh, a, a possible mistake. You have to be aware. Of course, we suffered a lot, but we should not capitalize on that uh, and, and say that, well, therefore, we are the most uh, morally uh, a perfect uh, nation around. And, and well, Hungarians tend to, to think that way. Just think about the football match yesterday um, against the, the Germans. Uh, um, we uh, led two times in, in that game and we thought that, well, you see, we can uh, uh, even uh, win against the Germans while we have this uh, notion that uh, football is a game that is played by 22 and that is won by Germans. So. Uh, Finally, the Germans did not win, but neither did we win. And that's, uh, I think, in a way symbolic about um, this uh, tension which we started our discussion with uh, between the West and the East. Uh, I think mm -hmm. neither can win against the other, or if they would, then, then Europe would lose. Mm. So the, the, the final question uh, connected with this, in fact, is from Andrew Taylor. Uh, and I'll just read it out. In the West, the challenge to social order is coming less from an overbearing state and more from an ever more fragmented and hyperactive individualism. Uh, the idea that my personal identity overrides any sense of social and community cohesion. All conservatives know that we need to challenge this, but how do we do it? Conservatives recaptured the state in Eastern Europe. How do we recapture civil society in the West? Uh, so at least I don't feel guilty about asking all the very big questions uh, during the interview. So <laughs> I will not have a, a short and easy answer for that, but I think that we, uh, we in the East uh, uh, still are struggling with the same problem than, than the, the, the West is uh, experiencing. And I think that the best thing to do is to, to leave this uh, conversation and to go out to, to see your, your um, you know, uh, neighbor. <laughs> The, the, the street uh, where you live uh, and, and to try to see um, uh, how it uh, actually is uh, architecturally designed, uh, what is the, the fate of it. Uh, we in, in Budapest, for example, have a, a tradition to, to look for the history of, of uh, the owners of certain uh, um, uh, houses, as well as the famous uh, 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 people who lived there and, uh, and you know, you, you can um, have small um, memory uh, cards uh, for for that uh, to 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 remind um, uh, your uh, children about uh, the, the 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 important uh, uh, parts of the history of the, your local uh, surroundings and also uh, we have got this tradition uh, to see. 
from which houses uh, Jews were taken away uh, in the Second World War uh, during the, the Holocaust. So uh, again, something that we have to learn uh, in, in our locality. Uh, I live in, in such a house, so that's why I, I, I know that. And so it, in, a, in a certain sense, we, uh, all of us have neighbors. Uh, sometimes we do not know them. <laughs> and that's, I think, uh, something which might be done. My, my, my wife uh, likes to go down. We, lo we live in a, uh, 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 you know, a, a multi-flat uh, house. And, and so he, 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 she goes down uh, and uh, takes care of the little garden down there. And, and every time someone comes and goes, uh, they have to converse with each other. So in a way, you know, the, the, the opportunity is uh, created to, to, to get uh, into contact. And I think that the point that uh, the question refers to is exactly this, how to get into um, contact with others, how, how to get acquainted with our neighbors. Uh, and that's also, you know, a Christian uh, mission of ours. I think you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm very glad to be finishing on this note. Uh, I've got an example in my personal life of this. Uh, uh, about three or four years ago, uh, one family who is in fact only renting an apartment uh, in the uh, building that I live in uh, and stayed here only for a year, uh, suggested at one point they went knocking door to door uh, on uh, Christmas Eve uh, that their daughter, who was a student of the cello, would play a little concert. She would sit on one of the landings and they invited everyone to come out uh, and listen to her play. It was a wonderful little little event. Uh, of course, um, you know, uh, she didn't need to do anything and, and it only lasted for, 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 for a few minutes. Uh, but uh, the group of people living in one stairwell suddenly became a community. And long after these, these people who, you know, came through um, this building like a meteor and are now gone, left behind them a community of, uh, of neighbors who now speak to one another on regular basis and started putting out plants in the landings and, and caring for them together. That's a beautiful, beautiful example two, for two reasons. One is that uh, because uh, uh, of the, the memory of Roger, who of course uh, always tried to, to push this issue that, that indeed uh, there, is a, there is a possibility to, to have a, a community of, uh, of, of neighbors uh, around. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I think that's a Scrutonian note. But also because we are living in a, an age of, uh, of COVID virus, of the pandemic. Mm. And, uh, and what we learn uh, in the pandemic when we are home officing, for example, is that, that you know, we have got more uh, opportunity to, to, to at least see uh, or to, uh, to watch or to, to call uh, the neighbor and, and help as well. So uh, we have got this uh, nice um, uh, uh, television um, uh, uh, broadcasts uh, of, of Italian cities uh, singing together, you know, uh, in, in, uh, in different uh, melodies, different uh, um, tones, uh, uh, competing with each other as in, in Venice, in, in St. Mark's Square. So I think this is a, a, indeed a chance uh, to experience something uh, uh, in common. And, and that way to share uh, our uh, uh, um, uh, fears and, and um, depression and, and in that way also to share our joys uh, as uh, Scruton, as Charles Taylor, as McIntyre and all those um, uh, uh, Catholic or, or Anglican authors uh, suggest. Hmm. Well, so now as we're hopefully uh, now leaving the pandemic behind, the advice um, is, as I take it to, uh, go out to your neighbor uh, and connect with them and do, do something. Uh, and that will by itself take care of the life of the mind, uh, at least in the scale of the community. So I think that's a very good note to end on. Uh, and hopefully uh, uh, in not too long, we'll be able to do these interviews in person with just one and not three cameras. And so we'll be able to go out to one another rather than sit at home and, and only see each other virtually. Uh, so thank you, thank you Ferenc again uh, for, for agreeing to, to do this. It's been an excellent conversation, which I've enjoyed very much. Um, and hopefully thank you'll make sense that we'll do under the auspices of the Roger Scruton Legacy Foundation, where we'll have further opportunities to talk uh, and to continue our discussion of 
uh, these topics. Well, thank you both. Uh, wonderful discussion, Ferenc and, and Mikawai. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it and I'm sure I, I speak for everyone here who uh, and similarly found it edifying and interesting and hopefully our audience who watches this on YouTube uh, after the fact. Uh, so thank you both. Thank uh, you for the invitation to share as well.